Uh, so welcome to um, everyone to um, ASIC seminars. Um, and this is John, the seminar coordinator, and um, together with me is Ms. Kathy Medley. Uh, so Kathy is our communication specialist. Kathy and I will be the moderator today. And today we are excited to have our distinguished speaker, um, Professor King, joining us from New York. And just so you know then, um, the seminar is being recorded and will be later published on our YouTube channel. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat. Um, and Kathy will um, read them out loudly. Or you can raise up your virtual hand and she will unmute you. And you are welcome to bring up any questions. So today um, we are privileged to have Professor Mark King um, with us. Um, Dr. King is a younger um, Velasen Professor of Earth and Climate Science Emeritus and Neymang Dorsey Earth Observatory of Columbia University. He is a founder of Master of Arts program in Climate and Society in Columbia. He received his BA and MA from Harvard in 1965 and PhD from MIT in 1976. Like so many other oceanographers, Dr. King was born in Brooklyn, New York, in the days before the Dodgers left <laughs> and precipitates the decline of American civilization. Uh, with Neyman colleague, Dr. Stephen Debiak, he devised the first numerical model able to simulate El Nilo. In 1985, this model was used to make the first physically based forecasts of El Nilo. Dr. King continues to work on El Nilo prediction and has also worked extensively on the impact of El Nilo and climate generally on human activity, especially on agriculture, health, and most recently conflict. His efforts over many years were instrumental in the creation of the International Research Institute for Climate and Society. In recent years, Dr. King's research interests um, have often focused on annual climate problems from the Pliocene to the last millennium and the night they shed on future climate change. Dr. King has written one book and more than 250 papers on a broad range of topics, as has served on numerous international and national committees. Dr. King has been honored with many awards and is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Science and of National Academy of Science. Okay, so I um, welcome that. Um, let's welcome Dr. King, and I will give the board to Dr. King. Dr. King, please proceed. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not sure what, let's see, you're sharing your screen. Okay, so that's good. I hope now, uh, hmm. Yep, looks, that looks perfect. That looks good, okay. Yeah, that looks, that looks great. Great, okay, so, um, my, um, despite all that, what was in all that biography, I'm going to talk about the Atlantic and longer term variability than ENSO, um, what is sometimes referred to as the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, Atlantic multi-decadal variability, and so on, and mostly I will talk about the sea surface temperature signal in the Atlantic but also about the North Atlantic Oscillation, which is the uh, principal mode of atmospheric variability over the Atlantic. Um, this work is all done with collaborators at the University of Miami, Amy Clement, uh, Jeremy Clavens, who's about to get his PhD, Lisa Murphy and Katinka Bolomo. And um, we had other co-authors on other papers, but this is a core group. 
And I want to thank all of them, thank all the co-authors, and um, thank our very many critics um, who've no doubt uh, taught us a lot and led to more work. So, oh, I, um, well, that's not good. Hmm. Okay, I seem to be completely locked by WebEx. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second. Your screen I, I can't um, make my up. Ah, there we go. Am I still sharing? Okay. Yep. So something went wrong and it wouldn't. All right. Uh, you'll notice a, a red, some red words that came up in the lower right hand corner. Um, this since what I'm about to say bothers a lot of oceanographers, um, I want to show you that I'm very loyal to the Atlantic. Um, this is a picture of Reese Park where I went as a child when I grew up in Brooklyn, as did the oceanographer Arnold Gordon. And um, when we got older, we would go to this beach by ourselves on bikes or uh, buses. And I imagine that Bernie Sanders did the same. Okay, um, I mentioned all those papers. We have a whole lot of people and we have a group of uh, papers that are basically the substance of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I think most people know what the Atlantic Meridional Oscillation is. It's gotten attention because it's been related to a lot of societally important climate variations, um, in particular to um, rainfall over Europe and the US, to um, hurricane frequency in, and landfall in, uh, in the Atlantic sector, and uh, drought in the Sahel and so on. And it's defined in different ways by different people. I tend to go back to the definition from the original papers by uh, Dave Enfield and um, the article by Dick Kerr in the science that kind of made it famous. So an index of the AMO is the average temperature, SC surface temperature over the entire North Atlantic, the, the anomalies from climatology. It's usually detrended and low-pass filtered to bring out the multi-decadal. You can see the pattern of temperature. It's usually called this horseshoe pattern, um, where uh, basically the more intense changes are in the tropics and high latitudes and on the eastern side of the Atlantic. And the picture below is the time series of this index, and um, this one is from 1856 to 2010, and you see what appears to be uh, variations with a period of something like 60 years, but um, it's not regular. Okay, so here's what I'll talk about today. First is the idea that the AFV and we'll see later, the NAO is largely forced by um, external radiative forcing due to um, greenhouse gases and aerosols. This is not a very new idea. We certainly didn't originate it. It goes back uh, through many, many papers. But despite that, many, many people don't buy it. Okay. Um, we can then ask, what, what does the ocean, okay, this is a forcing above outside the atmosphere. So what is the ocean's role in all of this? Um, this is important because many people think this variability is associated with the Atlantic meridional overturning circulation. Okay. So thinking of the force part as a signal, What's the relation of that signal to the internal variability, which we can think of as noise? And is the internal variability all noise in the simple sense of, you know, being fairly random, 
or are there organized circulation features such as the AMO that matter for the sea surface temperature or for the NAO? And I'm going to talk about some very recent work, not all published yet, or some just published by uh, Doug Smith and others on decadal predictions, and then we'll have conclusions. And uh, if we can manage to figure out how to do it, please feel free to ask questions in the course of this. Okay. Uh, on the left is a, an index. This time we're calling it the North Atlantic SST, NASST. It's basically the entire, um, the uh, linearly determined index over the North Atlantic. Um, and the uh, light curves are individual members, um, in this case, of a 10 member ensemble, the last millennium ensemble from using the NCAR model. And uh, the heavier line is the average, the mean of all of those 10. And you can see that it kind of, it traces with some fidelity the ups and downs of the observed um, NAO, AMO signal, okay? On the left is a plot of the observed and also the ensemble, the quote known as the large ensemble, um, the CESM ensemble with 42 members. And this is from 1920 on, that's where they started it. And again, it kind of gets the ups and downs. Um, you might say it's not brilliant, but it's clearly getting something, okay? When we take the mean, especially of the larger ensemble, it means that the internal variations are largely averaged out because they occur randomly in time. And so we're left with the fourth component only or mostly. If we had an infinitely large ensemble, it would be only. Okay. Now, if we look at the large ensembles correlation with the observed um, AMO with the NASST linearly detrended and low pass filtered. So we're taking the North Atlantic temperatures for the entire North Atlantic, taking out the trend, which is there of course for because of greenhouse gas and low pass filtering and um, this is what results. So it's a picture of um, a kind of periodogram. Well, not really, but it's it shows you where the individual forecasts lie from different um, of these ensembles, and I'll come to what they all are. But the main thing to note for now is that the large ensemble mean correlates at 0.79 with the uh, observed, which means that the model indeed captures a substantial part of the variance of the, the AMO. Now, if I just took the so-called pre-industrial PI controls, which have no historical forcing, I get the green points and the green curve, okay? And what you can see there is that that, um, roughly speaking, has a mean correlation of very close to zero and um, can be positive, can be negative, as you'd expect from a random numbers. And in fact, if you just generated numbers at random and then uh, did the detrending and low pass filtering, you'd get the black curve, which is pretty much the same as the green curve. And if you took the forced part out, the mean out of the large ensemble, you get the blue curve, which again is indistinguishable from what you'd get from random. So the point is that the mean um, average gives you a quite high correlation. And without that force piece, you don't get it. And this is the same sort of picture, but 
for the large millennium ensemble correlated with the observed from the beginning of this record in 1854 to 2005. And again, the correlation is high, not as high, it's 0.72, but it again can be seen to rely on the forced part, the ensemble mean, rather than on um, internal variations sort of matching up by accident. Okay, so we're getting the idea that um, the model with the forcing can simulate the observed and without the forcing, it rarely does. Okay. And in fact, here's another view of the same thing. All of that before was with the NCAR model. This time we have the correlations of all of the CMIP-5 models with um, the observed AMO and uh, it's mostly over the 20th century. And this is from the paper by Murphy et al. in 2017, another one of our group's efforts. The colors showed you show you the ones with the historical forcing, forcing these models. The black are pre-industrial, okay? And again, it shows that the CMIP-5 models without historical forcing just don't get it. They don't get the observations. And uh, the colored ones, the external forced ones, do much better. And in fact, you can see that the internal ones rarely, even at the extremes, manage to um, come to the level of the forced ones. So that's it. Okay, so the AMO especially the recent one, is largely forced, okay? So, but what's the ocean do? Okay, there's a mixed layer, uh, which absorbs temperature, but what can we say about ocean dynamics? All right, um, so maybe they have something to do with the nature of the response. Those were all coupled models. They had an active oceans. And what we did in the Murphy et al. 2020 paper was to add to the mix uh, a model 10 member ensemble with a slab ocean. That means the ocean has a fixed climate, the mix layer, excuse me, ocean mix layer has a fixed climatological depth and uh, has no active dynamics. Um, so basically, this is an atmosphere running with uh, just a like a total swamp underneath. Okay, and here's the picture from 1920. Again, this was part of the set of these NCAR lens large ensemble ones, and so it was matched to the uh, fully coupled here labeled FC. There are a couple of different observed versions. Things are all a little bit different, but you can see basically um, most of the, the curves are more or less alike, while the models are more or less alike, and the observed two curves differ, but they are also uh, rather close to each other, and, and there are some, the models are more different. All right, if I um, look at the temporal correlations with observations, um, surprisingly, I think, we find that the SOM, this slab ocean model, SOM, uh, largely is the equal of the fully coupled model, or the LME. In fact, it's, uh, by this measure, its mean is slightly better. The um, what we're seeing here is the 10 year low pass uh, filtered response from 1930 to 2005. I won't go into why we picked 1930 for the moment, but, and you, we have in colors the fully, the um, 
externally forced the so-called hist type runs for this slab ocean for the fully coupled and for the last millennium ensemble, which is also fully coupled. They're all about the same. The black curve is what you get from just the internal variation where the mean is taken out. Again, it doesn't look like, it doesn't correlate with the uh, observed. And um, there are here some unfiltered runs and um, statistics from 1920 onward. And the basic message is that the slab ocean does at least as well as the fully coupled model, um, a little bit better, but let's just leave it as at least as well um, and not get into any, try to get into discussions about whether the difference is significant. All I need to say is that they're about the same. Okay, if I look at the spatial pattern, the upper left is the observed, okay? And these are made by doing a regression of SST. There are other things on the plots, but we'll ignore them. Uh, on the AMV index, um, in each case that would be, with the models, it would be the models version of the AMV index. AMV, AMO, and ASST, they're all the same. This is basically uh, deep trended, low past, and so on. All right, and you can see that all these model versions look something like the observed. Um, to my eye, the best comparison is perhaps with the lens SOM, the um, slab ocean, what we called MOE, which means we take all the individual ensemble members and find the uh, the pattern that best correlates with all of those. Remember that each each ensemble member will have a somewhat different AMV because of uh, what the internal noise does. Um, that's slightly better, perhaps, than the lens SOM EM, which is just to take the mean of the ensemble values and um, find its AMV and then do the correlation. And the bottom row has the fully coupled ones and four on the right is the um, pre-industrial version. And um, it's interesting that it's actually more intense than the forced one. Okay. And in fact, if we just look at the spatial correlations, you know, to get a score, because everyone likes to keep score, um, you can see that uh, these say that, again, this, the SOM, the slab, does somewhat better at simulating the pattern than the fully coupled one. And this is kind of holds over whether it's the uh, taking the mean or taking the um, taking the mean and then getting the correlation or getting all the correlations and uh, looking at how at, at that or using the pre-industrial run okay and you can see generally speaking um, that the <clears throat> if you look at the individuals then the SOM are rather tightly spaced and they um, they all do almost all do better than any of the fully coupled ones. Now, there are a couple of interesting things about that to notice, and then we'll go on and explore. Okay, the first is that um, the pre-industrial and the forest have about the same pattern. So that says there's some relation between what's forced and what's internal because the pre-industrial can only have internal climate variations. They're run with a climatological um, external radiative forcing, you know, the sun shines, but they don't change the intensity of uh, the sun shining. They don't 
change the aerosols in the atmosphere and so on. So that's one point. And the second point is that we, um, we're, we're left with the fact that the slab ocean seems to do better uh, or at least as well, let's say, but the pattern actually looks markedly better than the coupled ones. Now, getting as high correlations as we get from all of this um, puts a bound on how much can be internal. When you take a large ensemble and you take the average, so you've gotten pretty much the fourth signal period, and you get correlations like 0.8 or close to 0.7 to 0.8, that's telling you that you've explained uh, most of the variance by a forced model, by the forced part of a model. Okay? And from that, uh, from that correlation, you can estimate the signal, the force part, and the noise, the internal part. And this says that the, depending on how you do it, the, um, from 1920 on, you're getting about 30, let's say 33% of maybe a little more of, uh, the forcing, 33% uh, of the response is um, internal and, uh, you know, the rest is forced. It's a bit lower for the longer period. I'll come back to that in a second. Now, I have a maximum and a minimum. The maximum says, okay, the model and the forcing perfectly capture the forced response. That's the maximum. So. In other words, the, the model is capable of, of just catching all of the forced response of reality, okay? That means the model does it perfectly that, uh, well, any of you believe that, that's fine. Um, and the other problem with that is that we don't know the forcing perfectly. And so the fact that the 1854 to 2005 one is shows more internal variability could be because the forcing is less well known the further you go back in time. Or it could be that when you get before the uh, industrial era or the heavily industrial era, in fact, more of the signal is internal because less of it is forced by greenhouse gas and by industrial aerosol. And it also is not likely that uh, there's no internal variability because, um, and that everything in the real world is forced because that just doesn't seem likely. So from this, I would say roughly, you could say that the signal to noise, the force to the internal is something on the order of two to one. And maybe it's not a good idea to try to say more than um, two thirds to one third, because I don't think we can be any, any more precise than that. By the way, the models have too much internal variability, and this has popped up in what um, Smith and Scaife, or Scaife and Smith, and others have dubbed the signal to noise paradox, meaning, um, Turns out for a lot of things, it was harder for an ensemble to predict the model mean than it was for the ensemble to predict reality. And that's because the models are just too noisy compared to reality. Okay, let's go back. How does the signal relate to the internal variability? And is internal variability all noise or in, in the sense in which we usually think of noise, not just you know, sort of random occurrences, because I'm sure you're all familiar with the idea for this in the subject area that the meridional overturning circulation is quite important for multi-decadal variability. So going back to the first paper we wrote, the 
one that appeared in Science, Clement et al. Um, you can see here the observations are on the left, the coupled models are on the right, and again, this is uh, uh, pre-industrial, and it reproduces the pattern as we had shown before, and of course, so do the slab ocean, and that maybe presents a problem because it says that the atmosphere and constant depth ocean generate about the same AMO patterns and better with the amplitude of the time series as a model with fully active ocean dynamics. Okay. Now the ocean has dynamics. There's an ocean circulation and it transports heat and salt. The um, slab model has no salt and it has no very, it has a so-called Q flux, a fixed heat transport, but it has no varying heat transport. So how is that possible if you leave out the circulation and the, and the salt? It, well, one interpretation obvious that seems obvious is that those things are just not important for the sea surface temperature. Or not very important. You know, so unimportant that we can't find their influence. Of course, another possibility is that the ocean in this coupled model is messing things up more than it's helping. So now if we look at the time behavior, what we see is that slab in the coupled models, whether it's CMIP3 or CMIP5, have about the same variance. And they all look like red noise. They don't have any, they don't show any multi decadal peaks. So that's, these are all pre industrial again. So it says if you just take out the external forcing, you don't seem to find any, any peaks. And Ba et al. looked at individual models. That was a, a composite over all models, just to go back, this was the um, multi-model response, but these are individual models, and you get about the same thing, except they put the, um, they ran it backwards from the way people usually present power spectra, but it's okay. And the AMOC doesn't seem to have any particular uh, peaks either. Of course, individual models are quite noisy. Now, to explore this further, let's go back and look at um, the heat, the equation for SST. And um, I can write it like this, the rate of change of temperature is due to the heat uh, flux divided by really the rho CPH, where H is the depth of the mixed layer, CP is the, um, specific heat, rho is the density, okay, the heat capacity of the mixed layer. So if we take the heating divided by the heat capacity, I'm calling that Q and there's a surface flux for perhaps, and I mean, there is a surface flux and a flux from the ocean, which we'll call Q zero. I've split the surface flux into a component that is a damping based on the notion of turbulent fluxes. That is, um, if the ocean heats up, then more heat is transferred into the atmosphere. It's a damping if the, by, by sensible and latent heat transfers. If the ocean cools down, less heat is transferred. And again, you're damping back. So there's a, definitely a damping term. There may be some damping due to the ocean. Um, models show this. But the, the rate of damping is far less than the atmosphere. So we're going to ignore that for now. And to make this really simple, I'm going to make the atmosphere flux, heat flux, other than the stamping and the ocean fleet flux, both to be white noise. Um, 
and uncorrelated with each other. White meaning they have no temporal correlation. Okay. And so that's the model. It's uh, actually uh, the equation that's written first is so general it applies to a GCM or anything. When I, when I simplify to um, white noise for the, these two fluxes, that's particular. When I take that alpha to be a constant, that's a simplification. Okay, where do we get with that? Well, first, are the fluxes white? Well, um, there were some papers a long time ago by Wunsch and by Stevenson that say the NAO is pretty much white. Okay, and we can look at what the CESM, the CAM5 pre industrial run does. And what you can see is the surface flux looks pretty white. That's the red Q sub S. Okay. And what's harder to see is the residual. I mean, mostly people have taken the residual to be the time rate of change of temperature minus the surface flux, and that and that's the residual, and they call say that should be the ocean flux. So you're putting the errors in there, but never mind. It's probably okay. And at low frequencies, you can see that the ocean flux then is residual and the surface atmospheric flux are have the same power. They're really indistinguishable and that makes sense because at as we go to lower frequencies, the time rate of change of temperature term um, decreases by several order of magnitudes. That's the green curve. All right. So this is not a crazy model to take things to be white. And what do you know? You look at this um, and based on that model and the fact that people looking at multi-decadal stuff always filter, okay, um, I compared the prediction from the white noise model of the temporal, the autocorrelation of temperature with itself in the upper picture with what comes out of the CCSM and what comes out of a GFDL model. And the agreement is quite close. If you also take the rate of change of temperature, which is, as we saw, proportional is, is basically the total heat flux and correlate that with the temperature, then you get the curves on the bottom. And again, the two general circulation models run in a pre-industrial form have agreement with this relatively simple theory where the uh, everything's driven by white noise. There's a damping from the atmosphere and, um, and you filter and that's it. And I must say, I've been in this business a long time now, 45 years or so. And this is the best agreement I've ever gotten between theory and uh, something like observation, although in this case, it's a model. Okay, just to make the point further, if you have a white noise force model like this, and you do the filtering, then the correlation structure is going to change with the filter cutoff period. So here I took that model and did cutoff periods of 5, 10, 20, 30 years, and you can see the set of curves. You get these peaks as if uh, dt dt leads t, fine, but the peaks are in different places depending on the filter and um, so on. If I apply these different filters to a 60 year forcing like people think sometimes think is the AMO, then you can see it doesn't really matter because you have a real signal, okay? If I apply the same thing to a model, this case, just the CESM, Okay, you can see that it looks pretty much like the white noise case and not like uh, uh, there's some something going on at a particular low frequency. 
Okay. Maybe there is something, but it isn't much other than this white noise. Okay. That um, is basically saying the pre-industrial stuff is white noise. We get a pattern out of it that looks like the NAO. And uh, yeah, that's about it. So uh, some more recent work, we've started looking at uh, predictions because one thing that's always bothered me will come up in the next slide from the Karspec et al. paper, but there's even more in a very nice paper by Steve Yeager a couple of years after the Karspec paper, okay? And then I'm going to look at two different prediction schemes. One is from a very a recent Nature paper by Doug Smith et al. They predict years two to nine, an eight year running mean with, uh, oops, sorry, with 169 initialized multi-model ensemble members over the periods 1962 to 2005. 77,000 years of model simulation go into this. These are all from very different centers around the world and um, they're initialized. In Clavens et al., which I'll date as 2021, because it's about to be submitted, we do the same, but with 269 uninitialized, that is their free running um, historical runs from what's known as the multi-model ensemble, uh, multi-model large ensemble archive. So we have 269 different ensemble members from six different models, uh, okay, which have ensemble numbers from in the teens to uh, 100 for the MPI model. Now, the CARSPEC paper, rather than saying uh, it's all forced and you can't get anything out of the ocean, seems to show that initializing does help in one place, and that's the subpolar North Atlantic. So something about ocean, uh, this paper suggests that something about ocean circulation that comes from the initialization um, matters there. Okay. And what is shown in the pictures is a, a place where you get much better correlation from the initialized model than a, a similar set of uninitialized models, the same historical fund. Uh, same kind of historical run I've been talking about. In this prediction business, it seems to be, it's been the custom to simply put in the external forcing as if you could predict ahead the uh, radiate greenhouse gas and aerosol, which is actually not a bad assumption for anthropogenic effects. Uh, and is not good for volcanoes, but there you are. Okay. Now, Carspec at all suggests that they haven't shown, I guess would be a better way to say it, that this has something to do with the overturning circulation. It might very well just be uh, a buoyancy. It, it might not be that buoyancy driven circulation. It could be something um, in a horizontal cir circulation in the gyre. And there's work that tends to agree with that idea, but this is certainly a far from settled matter. Okay. Now, so looking on the left, we have what you get from a raw ensemble, meaning you just take all the ensemble members and average them, and that mean is your forecast. Okay. The top is the Smith one, which is initialized. The bottom is the uh, Clavens et al. one, uh, which is not initialized. These are forecasts of the NAO. Okay. The left side are after what Smith et al. called post processing. That is, people play, you don't accept merely the raw ensemble mean, you play some games. Okay. So, uh, 
Anyway, what you can see is that, at least for predicting the NAO, the raw ensemble of uninitialized stuff did better, but the if you look on the upper right now, uh, the ensemble of uh, the the very what they call lagged and variance adjusted ensemble did better uh, did very well in predicting the NAC. And if we look at what the sort of post processing strategy in Clavens at all, it's pretty similar to the one from Smith. So. This is not showing any great advantage overall to the um, initialization. However, I would call your attention to the peak in the upper right uh, around 1990 or so, uh, and uh, in general in the late 80s and 90s in, in this smooth version, because these are eight year running means, okay? And that seems to be captured much better by the initialized ensemble than it is by the uninitialized ensemble. Overall, they're otherwise pretty much the same. Okay. And if I look at not just the NAO as before, but uh, these are the raw ensembles this time, the NAO, the AMV predicted in this way, and Northern European. Precip, um, okay, for the AMO, AMV, AMO, they're kind of comparable, but again, the um, uh, initialized version seems to do better with that dip and rise, dip in the late 80s and rise into the 90s and so on. So, if, and the, uh, for Northern European precip, again, this is a forecast of years two to nine ahead. Um, actually, the uh, they both do fair. The the uninitialized does a bit better. If we go to everybody's um, after everybody's monkeying around as much as they can figure out how to do with all of this, okay, this is what happens. Basically the numbers become comparable between the two and, and pretty high. It's nice to think you can get about half the variance of European rainfall. Rainfall is always tough. And last picture before conclusions um, is from this Clavens oral paper, which is about to come out. And we it's the Anomaly correlation coefficient, which we've been looking at before, but these are maps over the, the let's say, Atlantic region and then some, and sea level pressure, SST, and precip. And, you know, basically our um, being clever, which is the set on the right, helps a little bit for sea level pressure and, and SST and helps a good bit more for precipitation. Okay, I won't go into the details of how we'd be clever and you can make up your own mind if, in terms of uh, whether you just wanna look at the raw stuff or what people have managed to do with it by much manipulation afterwards if, if the issue at hand is whether it's forced or whether you gain by initialization. I would like to point out one thing. The middle panel on the right has a white circle. And you see there that indeed this uninitialized model by the blue color does a poor job of getting that part of the subpolar gyre. However, we also have to say that within that white circle is where um, the warming hole should be in these models. And so part of the issue might be that uh, while the initialized forecasts do better, perhaps it's not because of some feature of the ocean circulation, but because initialization does something to correct, correct a systematic model bias. Okay, and in conclusion, I'd rather not 
say these are conclusions, but hypotheses. All of this, um, well, we don't have too many observations of the ocean, so it seems hard to pin down. But here's my take on what things are like. Okay? The observed multi-decadal variability in the Atlantic is radiatively forced. That is, for the most part, but it's especially true in the Anthropocene. So about two-thirds of um, multi-decadal variability there seems to be forced. Less for rainfall, who knows, okay. Um, external radiative forcing forces what is a natural SST pattern and the NAO, which is another natural internal mode, okay? And those modes, I think, exist without the forcing. It's just that what happens is the forcing rings forces those natural modes that, that the uh, modes that are natural to the ocean atmosphere system, and so they come out with the largest amplitude. And so the greater impact of this external radiative forcing is not as much on the pattern as it is on the amplitude of the pattern that you see. And that showed up in the time series comparisons. What's going on internally is, I believe, largely short time scale noise that we can think of as white noise. Mostly it's in the atmosphere. There's noise from the ocean as well, but, um, and it comes out as a multi-decadal signal when you do a low pass filter. Now, coming back to what the ocean may do, in some places like the subpolar gyre, dynamics may well matter, but we haven't exactly pinned down how, and I don't think there's a clean demonstration that this is a buoyancy driven overturning rather than something horizontal or whatever it is. And also, I think there may be particular times like the early mid 1990s where ocean dynamics could matter. And again, um, it's not really been shown how that works very well. Thank you, I'm done. Questions? Thanks, Dr. Kane. Um, if anyone has any questions, they can raise their virtual hand. Um, if they, if you expand the participants panel, there should be a little hand icon at the bottom, um, and I'll unmute you, or you can send me a chat message with a question, and I can read it out loud. Give them a few more minutes to, to do that. Oh, here's one. Actually, first of all, I'll unmute Mike Evans. Mike, you're unmuted. Yeah, hi, Mark. Thanks, this was really fun. And uh, thanks for introducing me to this whole area. I didn't even know that you were working in, sadly. <laughs> um, so no, I have no, a question. No, I have a... Stay away from it. <laughs> yeah, well, perhaps. Um, so uh, I have two questions are kind of um, mm -hmm. somewhat unrelated. Um, so I'll ask them. Okay, um, I'll, I'll ask both of them. You can decide which one you want to answer, if any. <laughs> uh, so the first one is um, going from your last point that it's basically explained by thermodynamics and, and not by dynamics. Um, under under the under the expectation that the the um, the anthropogenic the greenhouse gas forcing is going to continue into the foreseeable future, say give it another century or another few AMO timescales, if it is an O and not a V. Um, do you expect the, um, the the pattern that we see, the spatial pattern, to persist? Um, and, and if so, why? So that's the first question. I'll stop there, maybe. I can answer that and then let you do the second. I think the pattern will persist with an overlay that's just everything gets warmer. Okay. So if you look back at some of those patterns, which, of course, it's a little hard. I could try to do that, but I won't bother. You know, in the, the pre-industrial, you got actually in the hollow of the horseshoe, it was actually blue, it got colder, okay? 
if you looked at the forced runs, they it just got it got warmer there, but not much warmer. So you still saw the horseshoe pattern. And I think that's what will persist. The whole thing will get warmer, but the um, you'll still get an enhanced warming, at least for, you know, until we get beyond uh, where some simple extrapolation that might still fit. And then after that, I can't say. It's tough to predict yeah. the future. <laughs> It is. Yep. So that brings me to this, my second question, which is um, the past, of course. So, um, so there was um, there was uh, climate field reconstructions by um, by uh, by Nate Steiger and others, um, and right. I'm thinking in particular of the paper that was um, I think lead authored by Rafi Newcomb in 2019 um, in the in Nature, um, like uh, no no no. No coherent uh, pre-anthropogenic uh, patterns of forcing. Um, in in a kind of a parallel paper, um, we found that um, that in reconstructions not of patterns but of of global s um, global surface temperature, um, there was um, a pretty um, consistent um, agreement between reconstructed and forced. Um, global surface temperature variations on kind of uh, because of clusters of volcanic activity over the last um, maybe thousand years, maybe close to two thousand years. So, question is: um, Have you looked at um, the um, those climate field reconstructions, those spatially resolved reconstructions um, from from Newcomb and Steiger at at Al to see whether um, there is this pattern in the Atlantic um, that arises because of not greenhouse gas forcing so much, but in the pre-anthropogenic, it's probably um, because of um, of uh, volcanic forcing. Yeah, um, I haven't really looked that hard at the pattern. That's a good thing to do, but uh, and I think too that this pattern would show up even with it shows up even without forcing and i expect that would be true in nature because um you know essentially all i mean by that is is if i think no, 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 it's... the nao or the you know atmospheric forcing as even if i think of it as simply white noise you know and there were no external radiative pacemakers okay yeah. i would still expect um a response with this pattern it's yes. just, you know, what the atmosphere likes to do. Um, exactly how much of it is due to the NAO, I can't say, but maybe a lot of it. Okay. Like a normal mode. Okay. Yeah, like exactly. It's Got like it. you're, you're rigging a normal mode. I think yeah. that's what's going on. And it would be very interesting to look at those simulations and reconstructions in this light. There are some papers I'm familiar with by Wang and... Um, Anyway, where they they look at the uh, reconstructions of the NAO and reconstructions of the what's supposed to be the AMO and uh, show there's a, a relationship. I don't. I'd have to look harder at how they did that. Um, that is, uh, and you understand this issue. The question is, okay, what proxies did you use? How many proxies overlap between? one reconstruction in the other. Yeah, and if you're using a data simulation product, to what extent are you using um, a, a forced simulation as, as part of your assimilation? And is it the same thing you're comparing to? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. So, it's, you know, and, and I mean, we, you know, these are hard problems. They're not, uh, it's not what people have done in this area is, is good work, but it doesn't, <laughs> No, there it is. It's still hard. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Sure, Mike. Thanks, Mike. We also have a question from Ross Salowich, who is also unmuted now. Hi, uh, Mark. Thanks for a great talk. So my question is directed towards what's really driving this um, in, in the atmosphere, and you. You didn't quite say as much detail about that as like in the Booth et al. paper where they implicate sort of patterns of anthropogenic aerosols. 
So like Mark, um, like Mike Evans, rather, I do have two questions. So um, okay. my first question will be, you know, has your group tried to separate for you know, the relative role of greenhouse gases versus tropospheric aerosols? And behind that question, of course, in my mind, well, maybe not, of course, is the notion that the spatial patterns of aerosol radio forcing is changing dramatically right now. I mean, you know, it used to be North, Am North Atlantic out, uh, outflow from America and Canadian pollution over the North Atlantic and Europe. Now, of course, we're cleaning our aerosols and uh, India and China are doing what we used to do in terms of aerosols. So the question is, in your model world, aerosol versus greenhouse gases versus where the aerosols are. Um, actually, Jeremy is doing a little bit of that, looking at the volcanoes in particular, but there's also um, some runs now of like the NCAR model where they um, pull, you know, they, they did separate runs with different aerosol forcing. So that would be a place to look at that without our having to, uh, you know, we don't have the resources to sort of make all these independent runs, but I think it could also be done um, statistically, you know, uh, just make a regression model on the forcing and you're welcome to do that um, since well, we haven't gotten to it. But. Well, we, we, we do a lot, my group does a lot of regression models uh, with, the AMV. So we're we're we have two papers under review right now. So we're, we're doing some of that. My my second okay. question. Well, do you find that? I mean, maybe you can answer then. How you know if uh, it gets a little tricky if you want to get at aerosol differences that way? I suppose. Well, uh, well to us, uh, it's a long story. I don't want to get too tangential here. But what my group does is attempt to account for the influence of AMV, and so tropospheric aerosols, et cetera, on global mean surface temperature to try to pull out the human component. And the big bugaboo in our work is the AMV, if it's human driven um, versus whether it's natural, that, that's kind of central to the science. But mm -hmm. I, I can communicate with you offline. My, my second question is perhaps my most important question, is how specific is the response to atmospheric forcing to which model you use and, you know, CMIP-6 has lots of simulations of historical forcing. Uh, has your group or anybody else tried to sort of separate which of the CMIP-6 historical models are able to reproduce the type of variability you showed from your model? Um, is it common or is it uncommon in the CMIP-6 models? Because I know it's not common in CMIP-5. Well, the... You know, it's pretty, uh, uh, man, let me try this. Huh. Well, oh, maybe I have to, I don't know how to, ah, okay. Escape. There we go. Nice. Let me just do this one. Um, remembering where things are is hard. I think it's this picture. Yeah, okay. All right. So these are CMIP5 models. Okay. And, you know, again, correlation with the observed AMO. I think this was all, uh, I don't remember exactly what period we did here. I should have written, put it in the slide, knowing I would eventually forget. But, you know, the gross idea that the force models do it and the other model and the, you know, unforced models don't um, is there. And I didn't, you know, for the most part, uh, well, anyway, there are a lot of models that seem to do, you know, one of the if we call 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8 a decent job, then they do a decent job, you know. Uh, and then there are some models that, that don't get up there that high. But, um, okay. you know. I, I, didn't, I, I didn't fully understand this slide. Can, so, so 
I apologize. Okay. Maybe my question is bad. What no, the, no, 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 no. It's good. I mean, what um, are the different colored circles? Um, like there's a solid circle and a bunch of others of the same color. Yeah. Okay. And I didn't explain that very well. Okay. Um, solid circle is an, like an average. So a, a lot of these models had ensembles, not necessarily, usually not very big ensembles, but ensembles. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So the solid circle is uh, the average. And the open circles are the individual ensemble members. Okay. And so you can see at the far right, we have the, you know, CESM large ensemble, which at the time 2017, when this was done, was the only really large ensemble available to us. Okay. Does that help? So, okay. Good, good, good. And okay. So this, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No, go ahead. You, you go ahead. I think that's, I hope that's clear now. Okay. So this is showing that you get um, representation of AMV in the forced. Yeah. This isn't the pattern in every model. So that may be more your question. And, you know, we really didn't. I'm trying to remember, I don't think we ever did like, you know, pattern correlations with with every one of these models. I mean, a lot of them get more or less the right thing, but, you know, uh, they didn't quantify that. Thank you so much. Okay. I got another question um, from Sumat. Um, Sumat, you're not unmuted. Uh, hi, Mike. Uh, Sumant here. Uh, nice talk. I have a question on your hypothesis. Uh, uh, in fact, more broadly speaking, uh, the Atlantic Atlantic multi-decadal variability has shown to be linked to Pacific decadal oscillation by Franklin Newell, Bill Peltier, and others with a lead time of about 12 to 14 years. Uh, so PDO is lagging the AMO or the AMV by about 12 to 14 years. So how does this uh, reddening idea, uh, in other words, yeah. that, if, the, if the surface forcing was happening, it was happening over all the oceans at the same time? And uh, how do I sort of see lead lags of such kind? Yeah, I mean, I, I, okay, there are two things I would say in response. First of all, there's work, uh, you know, by SCAFE and um, there are others, but SCAFE is the one I know best showing um, for shorter term predictions, a tropical Pacific influence on, um, <coughs> on the NAO and, you know, that seems pretty solid, but it isn't, uh, I believe is not really done for such long periods. Okay. You know, the other thing I would say is to look at is that the PDO is, I mean, it is my belief that this Atlantic, what we've seen in, you know, since 1920 or 1900 or something like that is, you know, is powerfully guided by external radiative forces. And of course, that's going to affect the Pacific as well. And these lead lag things are, you know, for something like this, I think are, are interpreting them can be problematical because if A leads, you know, we all know that uh, correlation doesn't mean causality, but we have a tendency to see if the correlation between A and B is such that A leads B, then A must cause B. Okay, and it it isn't true, and uh, you know it, it's certainly not guaranteed. So the first thing is, okay, what is the response in the Pacific to the same kind of forcing? And it's more complicated as you know, like in, in the Newman et al. review that sort of suggests the PDO is more than one thing and it might be forced and it might be internal too. And, you know, the Pacific um, has more demonstrated internal variability, at least at shorter time scales. So I kind of, uh, 
am ready to believe that it could have some internal variability as well as being uh, forced. So that's complicating. Okay. Whether, um, I don't know, you know, one thing, and maybe you know the answer, if I looked in a, for example, in, in a whole lot of pre-industrial runs, what, what kind of relationship would I get between the PDO and the AMO? Uh, that's a very difficult question because um, most of the models actually get a very poor representation of the AMO. I mean, you showed in your lead off slide, the right panel has not much of an AMO in the first part, uh, you know, pre-1960, LEM doesn't have much of an AMO signal. That red line is pretty close to the zero line. Uh, so I, what yeah, I'm yeah. suggesting, we have looked at the AR5 models, not the AR6, but the AMO, AMO is very poorly represented, both in terms of structure and evolution in these models. So it's a hard question for the models to answer. Yeah. And, uh, Yes, I mean, I, I, um, thank you. <laughs> I, yeah. I had pretty well refrained from model bashing in, <laughs> in this talk, but, um, you know, uh, I, I don't disagree with what you've said. I mean, uh, one reason we, I tend to focus on correlation <laughs> is that the amplitude in the models is so poor. Yes. Uh, you know, and and the other thing uh, that goes with that, and I think that's this whole business of, uh, you know, the so-called signal to noise paradoxes is simply that the models, uh, you know, the, their overall variant variability is is too low, but the ratio of forced variability to internal variability uh, is also way too low. So, um, you know, they don't pick up the patterns very well until they're forced uh, fairly violently. Um, and, you know, I, I showed some things I think we could get out of models, but, um, and, you know, was trying to be rather circumspect about what I claimed. And so, you know, call them hypotheses rather than conclusions because so much of it is model based. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you. Well, other questions and yeah, thank you um, Dr. Kane for giving a great presentation. Um, we'll be back next week for another seminar and every week until Christmas. So thank you everyone.